All right. Hey guys, it's Billy again. Good to, good to see you guys. Good to be back. As we do every time, we're going to just give it a few minutes and uh, make sure that the feed is coming through okay, make sure everybody can hear me and see me good, and uh, we'll just have, you know let everybody log on and make sure that, uh, that everybody's there. So, looks like, uh, looks like I'm getting a thumbs up from Zach over there that the feed's coming through good. So, uh, like we always do, we'll just give it a few minutes and, you know, hopefully we'll have some people jump on here as, before we get started. I hope you guys all got a chance to get outside today. I know uh, we had an awesome outside church service today, so I hope wherever you are, you got to take part in one of those, or at least just get outside, because it finally stopped raining for about five minutes. So I don't know how it is where you are, but it's been raining for what seems like weeks here. Uh, and yeah, I got a little sunburn too, you can tell. But good to be back. I uh, hope everybody had a safe and happy Memorial Day last weekend. Uh, you know, shout out to all the veterans, you know, current past or even future uh, armed, armed service members. We know we definitely respect you guys. That's one of those jobs that uh, I'm not cut out for, but I'm glad that somebody is. So uh, we appreciate you and thank you for what you do. Uh, cool. Well, looks like we got some comments coming through. David, good to see you, buddy. I didn't know if you are going to be able to make it on tonight. I'm glad you made it on. Uh, like David did, you know, go ahead and give us a shout out. Throw something up in the comments. Let us know that you're here. Let us know that you can, you know, that you can hear me okay. Uh, tonight's class will be, I hope, a little more interactive. We'll have some question and answer type stuff going on. So hopefully you guys can, uh, you know, we'll be able to participate in that. You know, I definitely want to try and make this a back and forth. Uh, Ronnie, good to see you too, buddy. Awesome, awesome. Glad to see you guys are, uh, are, are on and everything's coming through well. Well, cool. Well, with that said, uh, looks like it's been about two minutes, so we might just give it just a second. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll get some more people on. But tonight's class I called Controlling Your Environment. And if you're a regular attender of our Fuel by Faith classes in person, you've probably seen this one before. In fact, I know you have. It should be in your binders under the HVAC heading. Uh, but like we've been doing, we're reusing some of our old material, and I've changed around some of the slides and put them in a little different order or changed the pictures or something, you know, to make it a little more friendly for this format. But uh, this, is, this is a really good one, I think, for the time of year that we're in. So, you know, you can't really see your hands, but hands up if you've ever had a car with no AC or no heat. In fact, I've had several cars with neither. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight is environmental controls, and our tie-in tonight is controlling your spiritual environment. And I hope that this makes sense to you guys and you'll see what I mean in just a few minutes. Uh, Cliff, Cliff, I see you, man. Like your fish. I do. I did. I saw that earlier today. Man, that was an awesome, awesome fish. And I'll, I'll definitely give you a holler after we're done here. Uh, but anyways, uh, we're definitely going to we're definitely going to talk about controlling your environment both in the automotive uh, HVAC realm and we're also going to talk about controlling your spiritual environment. So, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get into our scripture tie-in for tonight. So, I wrote this uh, top part, and then the bottom part is from someone named Lynn Thompson. This is an article that I found online that I felt really, really kind of hit the nail on the head. So, we'll go with what I wrote, and then we'll go with what the professional wrote. <laughs> so, controlling your spiritual environment. Just as we can choose our environment using our car's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning controls, we can control our spiritual environment as well. By choosing carefully who we decide to spend time with, we dial in or out how much of their influence we're exposed to. And I think, you know, you'll see what I mean in just a minute, but hopefully this will make sense. So Lynn Thompson writes, as we encounter scriptures that address our temptation and struggles, our response is to submit ourselves to God in prayer. Through prayer, we allow our hearts, minds, and wills to be influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bad company does indeed corrupt good character. But if we remain vigilant, if we're honest about our own weaknesses, and if we seek out the protective, positive resources God has graciously, graciously given to us, we do not have to be drawn into the destructive power of sin. By God's grace, we'll grow in exercising the kind of Christ-like influence He wants us to embody in our relationships. And I know that's a mouthful, but hopefully you get the gist of that, is that we do have control. Of, of our environment and of who we are uh, and who we expose ourselves to and how much of their influence that we actually take into our own lives. You know, we're all going to be exposed to certain things and I think one of the best lines that, uh, Ms. that Thompson wrote is if we are honest about our own weaknesses. And I think that's something that we can all probably agree to, right? I mean, we all have weaknesses and we all need to be honest with what those are. And if we expose ourselves to that sort of thing all the time, then obviously you'll be a lot more likely to give in to those weaknesses. And so, uh, 
you know, that's one of the things that we do have control over. And a couple of scriptural uh, examples of this. Steve, I see you're on, buddy. Good to see you, man. I didn't miss you this morning, so hopefully we'll get to see you very soon. So our first scripture tonight is Psalms 1, 1 through 3. And most of these are pretty simple and straightforward, but I feel they really hit the nail on the head. So, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And this is, again, this is kind of going along with what we started as far as controlling your environment. But do not walk in step with the wicked or standing in the way that the sinners are mockers, right? And this is, uh, it's kind of interesting, and I've had this discussion with people in the past, you know, of course that we're, we're all sinners, and of course that, you know, we're not to, to necessarily reject anyone at, for any reason. Uh, but I think what they're saying here is I think, you know, it's, it's walking in the way that they do. You know, you can be around a certain kind of person or you can be around people that are doing certain things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to partake or that you have to act the way they, they do. Uh, and I think that that says a lot about us. You know, if we can hang out with folks that are doing whatever um, and, you know, you can kind of be that shining light or be that example. So it doesn't necessarily mean isolate yourself, but it definitely means, you know, don't do what they're doing just because they're doing it, right? And I think that's something that we can all, uh, well, I think we can all fall into that trap from time to time. Proverbs 12, or 13, 20. This one is very straightforward and very short. But walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. <laughs> and that kind of, uh, that one kind of hits home for me. Because not only have I suffered harm for being the companion of fools, I've often been that fool that, you know, has caused someone else harm too. So... Uh, that one is pretty straightforward. That's one we definitely need to take to heart, I think, if at all possible. And then another one from Proverbs, which I think is really good. So Proverbs 19, 20, and 21. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. This one, again, is a personal struggle. I'm not going to lie. Uh, accepting discipline, I don't think that's easy for anybody, right? I mean, who's got kids here, right? I, and accepting discipline is usually not one of their strong suits. Uh, but it's interesting here that it says you will be counted among the wise. And the last verse also said something about being wise, you know. And I think that kind of, you see a theme here, is that a wise person uh, is generally doing what they're supposed to do. So if you're, if you're doing something and you think maybe this is unwise, then it's probably not what you should be doing. <laughs> But I also like verse 21, and that's why I included it here. It doesn't necessarily tie into what we're talking about, but it says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And I really like that because I feel like, you know, it says that you can plan all you want, you can make all, have all the best intentions, um, but whatever it is that the Lord has in plan for you is what's going to happen, whether, you know, whether you want it to or not in some circumstances. But it's always the Lord's purpose that's going to prevail. So you might as well make it easy and go along with it instead of trying to go against it, right? And then 1 Corinthians, this is Paul talking here. And this one is really interesting to me because I, I feel like uh, I feel like he's getting kind of stern here, you know. I mean, if you read this, you can kind of put a little tone to it. You, you know, you can kind of hear him being a little bit stern with him in this letter. But 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 33, and 34 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I mean, we saw that in the earlier verse. Come back to your senses as you all and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. And I say this to your shame. And that's, uh, that's where I think he's getting a little bit firm with him. You know, he's kind of saying, look, I'm, this is kind of shameful. You guys need to come back to what you're, uh, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And there are some who are ignorant of God. And again, this is kind of a theme because in the last couple of verses, we saw him talking about being wise and walking with the wise. And in this verse, we see it says that some are ignorant of God. So I think we kind of see this theme going that, uh, you know, in order to be wise, we need to follow God's way. And if you don't know God, then chances are that's not the way that you're walking. But this is all to say that we can choose the influence that certain people have on us, you know. Of course, there are many verses in the Bible about temptation and about, you know, and about overcoming temptation and that sort of thing. So that's always going to come our way. But I think we have that choice as how do we react and how do we let it influence us. Um, so that's how we're going to, you know, tie this into controlling our environment. 
Now, on the automotive side, how do we control our environment? We do it with the HVAC system, our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And I'm going to slide the comments up here just to make sure that we can see everybody. All right, we've got some, uh, got some new faces on here tonight, I think. And if you're not new, then I apologize. But it looks like uh, Joseph Noble's on, Jeremiah Foy. What's going on, buddy? Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Pounds, Alan Pete, all you guys are on tonight, so good, 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 good to see you guys. Make sure you keep those comments coming through. I do want to keep it as interactive as possible, as I always say. But we're talking about controlling our environment. We're talking about, you know, in an automotive application, that's the inside of the car, the cabin of the car, that's the environment that we are in. And we do that with the HVAC system. And as I said, it's heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And it has several purposes. Its purpose is to clean, to cool, to heat, to regulate the flow, dehumidify, and ventilate air into and out of a vehicle's passenger compartment. So a lot of people think of the HVAC system as just making it hot or cold, right? And you could be forgiven for thinking that, and especially on some older cars, because that's kind of the only options you had, was hot, cold, high, or low, right? Well, with modern cars, especially with, uh, with automatic HVACs and dual zone and tri-zone, and you know they've got rear AC and front AC, and they've got these different systems, uh, it's actually doing a lot more than just cooling or heating the air that, that enters the cabin. And we're going to talk about quite a few of those right now. So the main HVAC components. Now this, this, uh, this illustration is a little bit simplified, but I felt like it, uh, you know, it worked good on this screen. So if you've got any questions or if you feel like something is out of place or whatever, just you know, go ahead and comment let us know. But we'll talk about a few of these, and we're not going to go in super detail on all of them, but I do have a few that we really want to dive into. So for main you know, all intents and purposes, we've got a hot side and a cold side. We've got the heater, the heater core and the side that puts heat in the car, and we've got the air conditioning system to cool the air and dehumidify the air that comes into the car, and that plays a big role into, uh, you know, defrosting the windows and that sort of thing. For the most part, though, we've got these two sides, and you can see here on the red, we've got a heater core, and if you were in, uh, if you followed along with our class is talking about heat exchangers and radiators and cooling systems and things of that nature, this is also part of your cooling system. This is where hot coolant will come from the engine through the heater core, and that's actually an aluminum radiator, for, for lack of a better word. It's a heat exchanger that looks kind of like a miniature radiator, and it has coolant that flows back out to the engine. And that is exactly as simple as it sounds. That gets hot from hot water from the engine and air blows across it and it blows hot air into the cabin of the car. So that is a relatively simple system. The AC system on the other hand can be a little more complex. Uh, in that we've got a condenser in the front, we've got a compressor, we've got an accumulator, usually a receiver dryer, we've got some sort of expansion valve or orifice tube in there somewhere. Uh, we've got the evaporator which is where the cooling actually takes place. Um, and we've got some sort of AC control module or AC and heater control module to actually control all of these items. In the old days, this was pretty easy, pretty straightforward. They would just have a flapper that would move the air either to the heater core or to the uh, evaporator core, and you would either get hot or cold air. But nowadays, and we've talked about this a lot, cars are trying to squeeze every ounce of efficiency, every uh, ounce of uh, miles per gallon that they can, and so they usually have very complex systems in the how much a refrigerant enters the compressor, how often it runs, you know, these kind of things, and especially with hybrid cars, electric cars, uh, cars that have the start-stop capabilities and things of that nature, it gets very complex. They, can, they even have electric compressors so that it can run when the car's off and that sort of thing. Uh, so we're going to get into some of that. But this is the basic components, and uh, every one of these is prone to failure in some way or another. Generally with heater cores, you'll see them leak inside the cabin of the car or they'll get clogged up with sediment, you know, rust and that kind of thing that are in the cooling system. Uh, with AC line, also prone to leaks, but there's a lot more places for them to do it. And because of the extreme pressure and temperature differentials, you know, a lot of the seals and gaskets and that kind of thing, even the hoses and lines can, can really get stressed out and get fatigued, you know, relatively quickly. So, that being said, let's go on to some of these components in a little more detail. All right, so we got moving air. So we got to move this air, right? We just talked about a bunch of the components. We talked about the heater core and the evaporator core and all that, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. But the first thing we got to do before we can do anything to the air entering the car is move it. And that's usually done with a blower motor of some kind. This is a twin wheel blower motor. You usually see that in BMWs and German cars. Uh, for the most part, this is what you're typically going to see in you know, just about every car and truck on the road. It's going to have some sort of squirrel cage or some sort of fan assembly, turbine, whatever you want to call it, uh, and an electric motor to, to spin it. 
Now this is where things get, you know, this is this has probably been one of the biggest improvements made in modern cars is the speed controller. So if you remember on older cars, you usually had like zero, one, two, three, four. You know, that was kind of your your speeds that you could select on the blower motor, and it would go, you know, slow, a little faster, a little faster, and wide open. And they controlled that with a resistor block or blower motor resistor, and it was physically just large resistors. And the more resistance, the slower the motor turned. They would just cut the current down to the motor, usually on the ground side, almost always. Um, and you know, the more resistance, then obviously the less current that was available to turn the motor, and it would turn slower. These have a number of drawbacks, though, because all that resistance generates a ton of heat. And that's why you see them, they're usually mounted in coils or some sort of aluminum block, some sort of heat, uh, heat sink. And they're almost always, in fact, they, I think they are always, usually in the airstream some way in order to cool them. And so all that heat, is, you know, just excess electricity, excess current, it's being turned into heat, so it's not being used for anything. And like I said, it, it worked, but you only had four positions because you only had a position for ever how many resistors that you had. Well, now they've got speed controllers, which usually mount in the same place, and they look very similar uh, from the outside. But what they're doing is they're actually pulse width modulate controlling uh, the motor itself. So they're actually able to change the speed of the motor indefinitely. So when you turn that knob, it can actually change the speed from very, very slow to a little faster, a little faster, a little faster, all the way to wide open and all the way in between. So you get a lot more variation. You get a lot more um, options as far as how fast you want to turn that motor. Now, as far as failure goes, they both usually fail for the same reason. The blow motor usually draws excess amps because it's old, it's wore out, it's got leaves, squirrel's nest, whatever piled up in there, and the more amps it turns, the more current is drawn through one of whatever device they use to control the speed, and you usually see an overheat situation. Uh, a lot of cars, GMs especially, uh, a lot of Fords too, they'll melt the plugs. You know, you end up with loose connections or whatever at the speed controller and you'll see melted plugs because of high resistance. And high resistance, of course, creates more heat and more amps. And so they just, they just end up overheating. This is one of those things, though, and we've talked about this before if you follow this class, you know, very often, that if you have a speed controller failure, if, you know, you, you end up having a car that the heat or the uh, blower motor only works on high, that's a pretty good indication that it, it is a blower resistor failure because on high, the resistor block is taken out of the equation. You turn the, turn the uh, selector to high, full amps go straight to the motor and it turns as fast as it can. But on any other setting, the resistor is taken into account and you actually end up you know, either making it slower or medium or you know, whatever the case. So if you have that going on and you diagnose it as a bad blower motor resistor, you could pull that part out and change it and everything will probably work just fine for a while. But usually there's a, there's a reason that they fail. There's a reason that they overheat. Very rarely do they just overheat for, you know, some kind of design flaw. Usually it's a case of amp draw from the motor. So if you replace the blower motor resistor, you might want to keep that in mind that it's a good idea to at least take the blower motor out, look in the squirrel cage, you know, look at your cabin air filter, uh, make sure that there's nothing, you know, hanging up, packed up in there, dust, dirt, that kind of thing, or it's not making noise or, or whatever the case is, because generally you can replace that part and you'll see it fail again because of high amp draw from the motor. And these solid state ones, they're even more susceptible to it uh, because they don't have the big giant coils to cool, you know, they, they're all solid state. It's all electronic in there and they don't, they don't tolerate that very much. So just keep that in mind. If you do end up with a speed controller failure, it's very likely to cause of or it's very likely because the blower motor is drawing too many amps. Speaking of cabin air filters, this is another, you know, often ignored part of a car. In fact, I bought a, uh, <laughs> I bought a 09 Subaru Outback a few years ago. And, you know, didn't think much of it, just jumped in the car, had relatively low miles. It was, uh, you know, pretty new car as far as, I'm, you know, my standards go. And jumped in there, drove it for a couple of months, and yeah, I'm like, man, this, you know, this doesn't really blow as hard as I feel like it should. I don't feel like the AC is working as well as it should. Um, everything seemed to be, you know, in spec. But I get to looking at it, and I pull the cabin air filter out, and it looked like a garden growing in it. You know, I think it was the original one, actually, from 2009. Uh, and so these are one of the things that do get ignored because often, you know, they're not out in the open. Uh, they're often, I won't say difficult, but they're not as easy to get to as, you know, your engine air filter. And so a lot of times they get forgot, get neglected. Uh, and these are one of the things that you definitely do not want to do that. You know, some, some reputable, you know, oil change shops or, or service centers 
we'll usually check this as part of regular maintenance. You know, you bring your car in for an oil change and they'll probably check the cabin air filter along with the air filter and, and you know, other things on the car. And if they, br they bring the air f uh, cabin air filter out to you, they're not just trying to, you know, rip you off or anything like that. It really is a maintenance item and it really is one that gets neglected very often. And some things that could, uh, that could really go south with a dirty cabin air filter. So it keeps dirt, dust, pollen, etc. out of the passenger compartment. Keeps leaves, debris, and other outside contaminants from entering the HVAC components such as the AC evaporator, heater core, and blower motor. Symptoms of a clog filter can include poor AC performance, bad smell, excessive noise, and shouldn't be replaced every roughly every 12,000 miles. That 12,000 deal is kind of a, you know, that's it's kind of a guideline, but you know, if you live down a mile long dirt road or if you're driving into a sand pit every day or if somewhere there's a lot of you know, leaves and, and pine needles and all that kind of stuff, obviously that's going to change that. You know, if you're out driving on clean roads all the time, yeah, 12,000 is probably good, but most cars will probably need one before then. And a lot of modern cars actually incorporate some sort of charcoal antibacterial uh, material inside the filter as well, so you're also cleaning the air, not just, you know, from dirt and dust, but from actual bacteria and that sort of thing too, so keep that in mind. And almost always that it's put on the intake side of the blower motor, so it's actually sucking the air from outside through the blower motor and into the rest of the car. And that's why if this is damaged or if it's dirty or, you know, air can get around it, you end up with all that dirt and pine needles and all that kind of stuff that gets blown into all these heater core and evaporator core elements. And usually to repair that, it means taking the dash out of the car. So that can be very, very expensive. And so you definitely want to keep that clean and, you know, keep it, uh, keep it serviced. So talk about heating the air for a minute before we get on to cooling air. Because heating the air is actually relatively simple for most vehicles. You know, some of them do make it more complex than it needs to be. But heating the air is usually the simplest part of the HVAC system. So as we said before, hot coolant from the engine's cooling system is routed through a heat exchanger called a heater core. The heater core is placed inside the air box, or plenum as it's called, and has doors to regulate the amount of air flowing through the core and into the cabin of the vehicle. Most heater core failures are physical leaking of the core or plugging of the core's internal passages. And we talked about that just a second ago. Uh, you ever taken your radiator cap off and you see that mud and sludge and rust and that kind of stuff inside the cooling system? All of that goes through the heater core as well. And there are very, very fine passages inside that heater core. And again, that could be a that could be a component failure. That means taking the dash out of the car and taking the air box out of the car. So, you know, a forty dollar part can turn into a nine hundred dollar repair very quickly. So it's important to keep the coolant clean, keep it flushed, and uh, and you know try to avoid any sort of any sort of contaminants inside the cooling system. This is a little bit better diagram of the heating system. Like I said, we had a kind of a simple one earlier. But again, you can see here we got a water pump, we've got the radiator, thermostat, you know, expansion tank, uh, and then you got the heater hoses. Anybody out there with a uh, Chevy Suburban, Tahoe, you know, any of those? Yeah, you probably had to replace the heater hose tees or at least part of them, uh, I'm sure of it, because they were really, really prone to cracking and failing, dumping all the coolant down the firewall. But you got the heater hoses and they actually go inside the cabin of the car, inside the airbox, and you've got your blower motor like we talked about, and it's blowing the air through that. So as this heats up, the air that goes through it is hot and it gets blown into the cabin of the car. If you get that sweet uh, kind of, it's, I don't know how to describe it, but if you've ever smelled coolant before, it smells kind of sweet, and it's got a very distinct smell. You get that smell inside the cabin of the car, or you end up with uh, a film on the inside of the windshield. You can kind of, It's kind of oily. That's usually an indication that there's a heater core leak, and they'll usually start very, very slight. You know, you might start the car up, you turn the heat on, and you smell it just for a second, uh, or you turn the heat on and you see it blow on the windshield, kind of an oily film on the windshield. That's usually an indication that the heater core is leaking in the box, and when you turn it on, you're blowing coolant into the car. So again, very important to try and keep, uh, keep the cooling system as clean as possible. Flush it out if you can, if you've got, you know, a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. And again, this is also part of the cooling system of the car. So, you know, if there's a problem there, chances are that there's a problem in the rest of the cooling system as well. So you can see poor heat performance from air in the system, you know, from a leak. Uh, if the water pump is failing, I've seen lots of cars where the impeller fails, and the only, the only indication that the customer presents to me is that the heat quit working. Uh, because a lot of times you'll see the impeller fail, and it'll have just enough to kind of keep the engine cool, 
but not enough to push through all these tiny passages in the heater core. And so, you know, you'll see uh, you'll see them complain about no heat, even though it's the water pump that's the failure. Uh, thermostats, bypass hoses, those sort of things, they all need to be in good shape because, again, that's all part of the cooling system, so you're actually affecting the way that the car cools the engine, uh, even with the, the heating system as well. It's all tied together. And we'll talk about cooling the air. So this is where things get a little more complex. So in, in the cooling, in the AC system, in the cooling side of things, this is a little bit better diagram than we had again. You know, this is, again, just dedicated just to the, the HVAR, or the uh, AC part. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll break this down, so bear with me for just a second. So the automotive air conditioning system relies on temperature and pressure differentials. The refrigerant is compressed into a high pressure, high temperature gas in the compressor and then condensed into a high pressure liquid in the condenser by transferring heat to the outside air. And the high pressure liquid is then pumped into the orifice or expansion valve, changing into a low pressure liquid. And this low pressure liquid is then sent to the evaporator where it's changed back into a low pressure gas and sent to the compressor. The heat exchange by the evaporator and inside cabin air is where cooling occurs. Okay, I know that was kind of technical and kind of a mouthful, but we'll see if we can, we can kind of break it down for you just a little bit. Uh, again, this is AC season, it's starting to get hot outside, you know, especially with all this rain, it's muggy and humid and so on. Uh, and so we're going to talk about how this actually works and why under normal circumstances you should not lose any refrigerant. You know, I know some people have cars, you know, mine included, uh, that you might have to add some to every year or every couple of months or whatever the case is because there may be some small leak. Uh, but for the most part, refrigerant is not consumed. It is, it should be a sealed system and should not lose any. So if you are losing it, if you are having to add to it very often, then there's definitely a leak somewhere. Uh, and they can be a little tricky to find. You know, we've got UV dye detectors, we've got ultrasonic, uh, you know, sniffers and things of that nature that we can use to try and find leaks. Um, but, you know, it's a big system, it's very complex, and it can be tough to find leaks sometimes. But if you've ever noticed on the front of your car, in front of the radiator, if your car has AC, uh, will be a condenser. You know, it's a, it looks like a, looks like a radiator, but it's thinner, usually. It's usually mounted in the very, very front, usually in front of the radiator, up in the airstream of the car. Uh, and we've got the compressor there, we've got a fan that moves the air through the condenser, and we've got our AC evaporator core. It looks just like a heater core, kind of. It looks very similar. And again, our blower motor. So as this gets cooled, the air blows through that and blows inside of the car and you cool the air inside the car. But how does that work exactly? What's, what exactly is going on here? Well, on your compressor, which is almost always belt driven, like I said, there are some rare cases of electric ones out there on hybrid cars, electric cars, that kind of thing. But for what we're talking about today, that's belt driven off the serpentine belt, um, which side note, you know, definitely want to keep your serpentine belt and your idler and tensioner pulleys and all that in good shape because a failure there could be a failure in the AC system as well. But it pumps the refrigerant through from the compressor into the condenser. And what it's doing exactly what it sounds like it's doing. So that's a high pressure gas. And when the gas is actually pumped through the condenser, the air moving through it condenses it into a liquid, just like steam condenses into water. You're actually condensing that refrigerant into a liquid. And this is all under very, very high pressure because the refrigerant uh, needs that high pressure in order to, you know, go through the orifice and change states from a liquid to a gas. So it's, uh, it's under quite a bit of pressure here. And as it condenses, the liquid refrigerant is sent back through the system and into the orifice or expansion valve. And why is that important? There has to be some separation of the high side and the low side. And they usually do that. They used to do it with an orifice tube. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that or seen one, but it is a very, very, very small orifice, which is why they call it that, uh, inside the pipe. And, uh, and what it would do is actually block that flow of high-pressure liquid and create a, you know, for lack of a better word, a mist or, you know, a, a, a gas on the other side of that. And now, you know, most cars are doing that with what they call an expansion valve or TXV valve. And what they do is it's actually an adjustable orifice, and so it can sense temperature and pressure differential and actually change the size. But it's doing the same thing. It's actually changing it from a high-pressure liquid uh, into a low-pressure liquid. So it's actually, you know, basically creating a restriction. That low-pressure liquid then goes through the evaporator. Now, this is where the magic happens. Uh, that evaporator, as the liquid goes through there, the refrigerant has a very, very low boiling point. That's the point of it, right? You know, if it didn't boil, then we wouldn't get any heat exchange. So as it goes through the evaporator, it literally evaporates. And when something evaporates, it absorbs heat. 
And as the air blowing from the cabin of the car blows across there, that actually evaporates the refrigerant inside the core and that absorbs heat out of the air that is being blown across it. And what you end up with is cooled air on the other side. Well, as that refrigerant absorbs all that heat, it has to get pumped back into the condenser, condensed back down, and then it starts the whole process again. So this is why that's a sealed system that doesn't actually consume any of the refrigerant. It actually should technically never have to be recharged, although we know that's not always the case. But I say all that to say this. Almost always when somebody doesn't have you know, proper AC or they feel like their AC is not cooling properly, the first thing they want to do is add refrigerant, right? You go down to a local parts store, you grab a can of that blue stuff and you stick it on there. and Sometimes that works. Not always a good idea though. Because of the pressures that are being dealt with in this system and the temperatures involved, uh, it's usually really, really bad idea in order in, in for it to be overcharged or have air in the system or some sort of contaminant in the system. Um, and, and again, you never quite know, you know, who's been doing it, how they've been doing it, that sort of thing. So most people's first go-to is to just add refrigerant. But that's not, that's not really the, the way we want to do things. Because there are a number of things that can keep this from working properly. We'll talk about those right now. Again, this is just kind of another diagram. I thought this was a pretty cool, simplified diagram. It's pretty much the same thing we just saw, but it's included in the handout materials if you did download those. If not, I'll include them in the, uh, in the description below. So, you know, if you want to get a chance to get all this on paper or, you know, on a, on a document form, um, I think it's PDF that it, that it downloads to. Uh, but this is just another example of what we're looking at. Kind of simplified. you got the compressor. You see it going through the condenser, the fan blowing through it. Uh, the receiver dryer, some sort of orifice, and then you've got the evaporator. So it's a very simplified version of what we were just talking about. But if you want it, it's there. So let's talk about the refrigerant for a minute. You've heard me say that. I've tried to avoid saying the word Freon, uh, although I did put it up here because that's what most people know it as. But Freon is actually a brand name. Uh, it's actually refrigerant is, you know, what we call it. But Freon, you know, if you went in there and asked for two pounds of Freon, they'll know what you want. Uh, but the two main types that we deal with today, now I know somebody out there is probably much, you know, more experienced than I am and had to deal with R12 at some point. Uh, that was pretty much being phased out as I began my career. But for most intensive purposes, uh, R134A and 1234YF are the two that we typically see in automotive applications. Now I know like, you know, some buses and RVs and, you know, houses and refrigerators, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of refrigerant out there and it's very important that you don't mix them up. For all, I, for this, as far as I know, I don't think you can mix them up because of the way that the connectors and stuff are made, but you just want to be very careful that you do put what, it, what belongs in the car in the car. So 134, uh, this is what replaced R12, like I said, in the 90s when I was beginning my career. Uh, 134 was already coming online. You still had quite a few R12 cars out there we were doing conversions and stuff on. Uh, but for the most part, 134 came online, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. And it's used since, uh, oh, there you go, 1994. Uh, no ozone deleting properties, but deemed a greenhouse gas. And so that was the big thing about it. It replaced R12, which was, uh, which was considered an ozone de depleting uh, compound. And so, you know, of course, we can't have a hole in the ozone, you know, killing the polar bears and the penguins and whatnot. <laughs> Even though it was cheap and worked really well. Uh, and R134 was very expensive when it first came out too, but nowadays you can get it for roughly $15 a pound and it varies from, you know, where you buy it from and who makes it and what brand and so on. But it's relatively cheap. Now, the 1234YF, this is what's been, uh, what's been coming online recently. Uh, the first time I saw it was in a Dodge Charger, I think somewhere around 2013 or something like that. But I think, they, uh, I think Mercedes has been using it. I think Kia has gone to it. I'm pretty sure most of the Korean ma uh, manufacturers, the Kias and the Hondas and, uh, and all of them have probably gone to it by now. But it, is a, uh, it has been widely adopted and deemed environmentally friendlier, though it costs roughly $75 a pound. Um, that's, you know, 750 bucks for a 10-pound cylinder. Whereas you can usually buy this stuff, you know, 150 bucks for a 30 pound cylinder in some cases. Uh, so that kind of tells you the price difference right there. And it works really well. And it's got some properties that really make it well, good for, you know, use in hybrid cars and electric cars and that kind of thing. Um, but it is a bit flammable. <laughs> it's, it's only about, uh, you know, it's just very, very close to propane. Uh, and it's very, very expensive. 
but the car manufacturers have started to use this because it is environmentally friendlier and it requires special equipment, special machines, special recycling machines to handle it and that kind of thing. So, and again, these two do have different types of fittings on the car, so you can't put one into the other unless you really, really try. Uh, so if your car does have 1234YF and the tech comes out there and tells you, you know, it's going to be a $200 or $300 uh, refrigerant charge, that's probably why, because that stuff is extremely expensive. But I haven't seen any real failures with that either, so, you know, it's kind of a kind of give and take. So we talk about the compressor a lot, and we're not going to get into every single component here, but uh, there are some things that I thought you know were interesting that we do need to talk about. So a compressor is, just as it says, it's a compressor. It actually compresses the refrigerant, uh, and it usually does that. There are several different designs. This particular one is a piston design that you see here, but they've got rotary compressors, and they've got different types of compressors. Um, but they actually, it actually looks like a tiny engine inside. They actually have tiny pistons inside there, inside a valve plate. Uh, and it actually pushes against the refrigerant and compresses it on one side and sucks it in on the other. And generally this piston assembly will rotate and they can actually change the, uh, change the amount and some of them, some variable compressors can actually change the plate and change how much it compresses it. And again, that's all in, a, in a, an attempt to get the highest economy out of the car because these things can create some serious drag on a car. Uh, if you've ever driven like an old Honda Civic or an old Camry or something like that with a really small engine, you turn the AC on, you feel like you lose 25 horsepower, you know, that's what's happening. You're actually creating drag on the engine. And so manufacturers have tried to reduce that drag as much as they possibly can to try and eke out a little more economy. Um, the big parts that we need to worry about are right here in the bearing, the pulley, and the compressor clutch. And we, I've got another slide on the clutch in just a second. Generally, we're not going inside this. Uh, maybe in the old days, they would rebuild them and put new seals and that kind of thing in them. Uh, but we're not doing that now. It's cost effective to just replace it. Uh, and generally, you know, we used to put uh, clutches and pulleys on them too, but you're not even doing that anymore. If you have a clutch failure, generally we're putting a compressor on the car. Um, but again, I wanted to show this because you can see how complex these can be. Uh, they are really like a tiny little engine that's driven off the belt. And so there are a number of factors in here that could fail. You could have piston failure, valve failure, you know, you could have some sort of bearing that, that lets go and fails. Uh, and this is why it's important about what you're putting in your AC system. These do require oil, you know, just like an engine requires oil. Using the wrong weight, the wrong grade of oil can affect this compressor just like anything else. Contaminants, you know, you had a pipe off and dumped a bunch of dirt in there, sand or oil, grease, whatever, and then you put the pipe back on. Those contaminants can end up in this compressor. It's just like an engine. You know, you wouldn't want to take your oil cap off and dump a bunch of dirt in it. You wouldn't want to do that with your AC compressor either. So that's why I wanted to show this and just show how complex they can be. Uh, this is one of those things that, again, don't fail often, but when they do fail, they can be very, very expensive and very hard to replace on some cars. The clutch, this is the one I wanted to talk about because this is actually one of the most common failures on an on a AC system. So AC compressor clutch is an, uh, an electromagnetic field. It's generated when current is applied to the inside ring, pulling the clutch disc against the drive pulley. So you can see here, this is kind of an exploded view of the clutch. So there's our compressor assembly. You can see this uh, clutch assembly, clutch and pulley assembly on the front of it. And this is what it looks like, you know, taken apart. We've got a very, very powerful electromagnet right here behind this pulley. And then we've got the actual pulley part where the belt rides. We've got a clutch face, and then we've got the clutch disc. And when you turn the AC on in the car, generally it used to be you flip the switch or push the button, and current would go to this compressor or to this magnet and you'd see it pull this clutch against the face of it and start turning. Nowadays they actually use you know more modules and sensors involved so you know the car when you request the AC it's not turning the AC on it's making a request and you can actually see that on the scan tool uh, and so there's a lot of factors that the car has to decide on whether or not it's going to let you have the compressor operation or not. It's going to look at evaporator temperature, outside ambient air temperature, inside cabin air temperature. It's going to look at RPM, engine load, throttle position. Uh, it's going to look at a number of factors and decide whether or not you're going to have AC. And so all of those things can play a big part in an AC failure. So just because the car's not blowing cold doesn't mean you just need to add refrigerant to it. Uh, there are a number of sensors and things involved that can keep this from, from actually coming on. Sorry, I got it. Got a cat running across the table again. It's a little bit shaky. All right. <laughs> but 
But again, this is a wear item. So you know, every time the compressor comes on and comes off, it's actually friction between these two surfaces that turn the compressor. So over many, 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 many cycles, you can actually see a wear pattern develop between these two, and it can get to the point where even though the coil is being energized, everything is right, the car is deciding it's going to let you have AC, uh, you can actually end up with a situation where it tries to pull it against it and just can't. Uh, so this is a very, very common failure. But this, again, is something I felt it was important enough to kind of, you know, kind of talk in detail about. Again, this is probably the first place that I would look if you brought me a car that said, I don't have any air conditioning. The first thing I'm going to do is try and see if the compressor is even being commanded on. Um, because, you know, and a lot of times, you know, it's totally full of refrigerant. Everything is, is there. But you just, uh, for whatever reason, you got a sensor, you got a module, you got something deciding that it doesn't want you to have AC. So this is just one of those examples. All right, talk real quick about directing the air. We talked about the HVAC system. One of its jobs was to direct the air, not just clean it, not just cool it, not just heat it. But it needs to direct the air to where, you know, where you want it, or at least where the car decides it wants it. Some cars, you know, they, they, don't, they don't care what you want. They, they give you what they want. <laughs> But this is kind of going back to a, kind of a 2D layout of what we looked at earlier with that air box with the, uh, with the evaporator core and the heater core and the blower motor again, you know, which we've seen a bunch of times. But this is kind of a neat, uh, neat way to see it. Now, I don't know. I hope it makes sense to you guys. I hope you can see it. Again, this is included in the handout materials, you know, to download. Uh, but right here, we'll start from the start. So when you hit the research button on your car, uh, what are you doing exactly? You're deciding on whether or not you want the air that gets pulled through the HVAC system to be come from the inside of the cabin or from the outside. And there's generally a door and it does exactly that. It flips one way and allows inside air into the blower motor or it flips that way and allows outside air into the blower motor. You know, most of you guys know you turn on max AC, it goes to recirc and it actually sucks the inside air out, cools it and cools it and cools it and it keeps going around and around and around so it actually cools cooler air. So usually you get much better efficiency running it on inside air. Outside air, you know, it's good for defrost and that kind of thing. You actually try to get a uh, temperature equal equilibrium. You try to get temperatures, you know, equal from the outside and the inside, so you would actually want to flip it over to there. But regardless, the blower motor then sends it to the evaporator core, and the blend door then decides how much of that air gets sent to the heater core. So, you know, you can have kind of midway, right, especially on modern cars with modern AC systems. You can actually just type in a, a temperature that you want. You want it 68 degrees or, you know, 73 or whatever it is you want and the car actually uses a, a series of sensors to determine how how hot or cold the air is and move this door to actually direct that air through the heater core to be heated or block it off so it strictly goes through the evaporator core to be cooled important thing about the evaporator core is that it also dehumidifies the air so when you turn the defrost on the ac should kick on by itself and actually uh, make that evaporator core cold and so that when the air blows through it you actually dehumidify it and then if it's, you know, you want heat, it can direct it through the heater core afterwards. But usually that's where dehumidification comes from. Most cars, if they fail, they fail in the defrost mode because it's the safest mode. Uh, but again, we've got another series of doors here that you can choose where you want to go to the floor or the vent or the defrost or so on. That's a lot of doors in a system. And those are all controlled by some sort of actuator. In the old days, you used to see this vacuum um, or mechanical actuation. It's literally a vacuum diaphragm that was hooked to a vacuum line to the engine, and if the car wasn't running, it didn't move. Uh, I've also seen these fail before where you could, you know, be going down the road and you get on the throttle and the vacuum drops and you actually see the doors, you know, switch to defrost until you let off the throttle and then it would go back to whatever you had it set on. I don't know if you guys ever experienced that or not. But then, you know, they started going to electronic actuation. GM started doing this, you know, early, early, you know, late 80s, uh, Mercedes, BMW, all of, all of them do it now. Almost everything is, is all electronic actuation now. These are another big prone uh, failure spot. I don't know if you ever got in a car, you turn, you know, the defrost uh, or the floor vent to one way or the other or temperature to one way or the other, and you hear it go click, 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 click. Uh, generally, that's what's happening here is that you end up with a... Uh, electronic actuator failure. They have little plastic gears inside there and after they move for a while they just break and wear out. Uh, but again this is another example where you might come to me and say my AC doesn't work or my heat doesn't work. Well everything might be working on the car. You know you might have compressor operation, might be full of refrigerant, you might have no leaks, everything's cool. Uh, but the actuator never switches that door over to AC or it stays on heat or whatever the case is. 
And most cars have very have quite a few of these. They have you know one for the passenger, one for the driver. Some have four of them, passenger, driver in the rear, or a three zone. You know, two on the front, one in the back, whatever the case is. So they can have a lot of these actuators. And anytime you have a change of position, there's an actuator somewhere doing that. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind. That's uh, I don't know really how to tell you that you know that how to prevent those failing. They just do whenever they feel like doing it. Uh, one thing I guess you could do is keep that cabin air filter clean so that you don't end up with anything physically in the way of the doors. I've seen that before, you know, McDonald's straws and that sort of thing piled up in the doors and these are trying to pull against them. But for the most part, all cars nowadays are electronic. So just thought that was something we'd include in this. Cool. All right, we're getting to the AC system diagnosis now. So we've been talking about a lot about the AC because that, again, is the most complex part. And it's the part that, you know, most people complain about, right? I mean, nobody wants to ride around North Carolina with no AC. I don't know who's watching this or where you're at, but chances are it gets hot wherever you are. Um, but we're going to talk about this a little bit, so we're not going to we're not going to go over every one of these, you know, exactly. But almost all AC system diagnosis starts with a set of manifold gauges. So you have a low side gauge and a high side gauge. And you remember earlier when we were going over the AC, AC system. We talked about the AC system being split into two sides, the low side and the high side. You know, you got the compressor and the orifice or thermal expansion valve, whatever it is that it uses to separate the two. And you've got one side that's always high and one side that's always low if the compressor is running. Now, if you hook your manifold gauges up to it and you turn the AC on and you notice that they are both the same, that means the compressor is not running or it's really, really, really dead. But for the most part, if the compressor is running, you end up with a high side and a low side pressure. And we can use those two readings to kind of diagnose what's going on in the system. Keep in mind that all these are pressure related, which means they are temperature related. Uh, pressure and temperature are very, very closely related. They are you know, interchangeable in some cases. Uh, high temperature generally means high pressure and low temperature usually means low pressure. So uh, in high ambient temperature conditions, you know, if it's 95 degrees and 100% humidity outside, you're going to see pressures a lot higher than you would if it was, you know, 65 degrees and no humidity outside. Uh, even though the system could be working perfectly in both situations, you would see different readings uh, in both cases. But for all intents and purposes, we'll, we'll call a normal reading, you know, somewhere in the 225, 250 range and, you know, 30 to 40 range on the low side. And we'll get to that in the next slide. But low pressure gauge in range and in range and that's what it that's why I went to say that because it doesn't give you a very a hard number there's no perfect number that you can look at and say that, that is no good because it's very very dependent on temperature humidity and pressure uh, but we'll just say that they're both good so that's AC working properly cool if the low pressure gauge is reading lower than normal and the high pressure gauge is reading lower than normal that's generally an ad refrigerant situation so that's a situation where you would say it is low in refrigerant Again, it's never a good idea to just add refrigerant because that system should be sealed. And so if you do have to add, it went somewhere. So you would definitely want to take it to some shop or somebody that you trust to do a leak test on that system. Uh, usually we can do it with vacuum, you can do it with uh, UV dye, or you can do it with some sort of electronic sniffer. Uh, but in any case, you don't usually want to just add refrigerant because that does mean that there is a leak somewhere. And now. If the low pressure is reading low and the high pressure is reading high, or high, that's usually an indication of a blockage somewhere. You know, the thermal expansion valve or the orifice tube or something is blocking the system, and you end up with a high pressure on one side, you know, really, really higher than average and really, really lower than average. And that's because the compressor is sucking against the blockage on one side and pushing against it on the other side. So you end up with this really really low section and really really high section um, and again you know that's going to take some serious diagnostic equipment to figure out where the blockage actually is you know a thermal camera or, or, a, or infrared thermometer or something like that you can usually find it that way there'll be a cold side and a hot side wherever the blockage is uh, the low pressure gauge reading high and the high pressure gauge reading low usually that's that's a dead compressor that's a compressor on its way out. So, you know, we talked about a little bit about a compressor being kind of like an engine, you know, having pistons and rings and valves and that sort of thing. Well, when you see it high on the low and low on the high, it's because it's wore out. So it cannot suck it on the low side. It can't pull as much as it should, and it can't compress on the high side as much as it should. So you've got blow-by or you've got some sort of situation uh, where, you know, it's losing seal somewhere. 
And so you end up with a low, uh, very high low pressure side and a very low high pressure side. Again, that's, that's generally a compressor failure. That's usually accompanied by some sort of noise, rattling, knocking, that kind of thing coming from the compressor itself. And then in the last one, we got low pressure gauge reading very high and high pressure gauge reading very high. I have seen this before. There's a couple of things that could cause this. But that's usually the system is overcharged, like we talked about in the beginning. You know, you go down to the parts store, you buy the can of stuff, you stick it in there, and you just keep sticking it in there because it's not getting cold, and so you just add more and more. That's usually an overcharged situation, so that's, that's to be avoided. Um, also, it doesn't say this in, in this little graph right here, but if you've got an airflow problem, so let's say that your fan doesn't work, or your radiator and your condenser, your grill is all packed full of leaves or, uh, or something of that nature, if, you're, if you don't have air moving through that condenser, uh, then the pressures will stay high because the refrigerant will stay hot. You know, there's no air moving, to, no air to cool it, no air to condense it. And so in a situation like that, you also see it. And a good way to diagnose that is take a water hose or a big box fan or something and spray down the condenser or put the box fan in front of it. And if you see the pressures come down while you do that, then you know you've got an airflow issue and, uh, and not an overcharging issue. So just something to keep in mind. I thought that would, you know, hopefully that's a little tip for somebody out there. All right, so let's do a little interactive action here. Let's see who we got on here. All right, we've got quite a few people on tonight. So, hi, right, Margaret, I see you're on here. That's cool. Kathy Carter, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> I hear you, Mr. Foy. I see you. Uh, so anyway, we've got some gauges here. So these are the manifold gauges that I was talking about, right? We've got a low pressure side and a high pressure side. And you can see the low pressure side pegs out about 60 psi, and the high pressure side pegs out about 425. Um, you know, each gauge would be a little bit different, but you usually see a range something like that uh, with these gauges. So we've got four different conditions. All right, we've got this one, this one, this one, and this one. And we're gonna we're gonna kind of diagnose these together. So hopefully you guys are still with me. Hopefully you guys are you know paying attention, um, and we'll go through these. So this one we're reading about 30 uh, psi on the low side and about 220 225 on the high side. Uh, and we'll I'll go ahead and give you a hint. This is a high ambient condition sort of day. So this is a day is probably like 80 to 90 degrees outside. Um, so what do you think is going on here? Any guesses? Give you a second. I know it's awkward, but I want you guys to uh, I want you guys to participate. So, come on. One of my regulars should know this. We've been over this, so you know, David, if you're out there, or Cliff, one of you guys. I'm sure you guys probably know what's going on here. All right, no takers. So this would be considered normal average readings for high ambient conditions. So this is this this would be a normal reading in a situation. This is reading in, in Celsius, but 30 degrees Celsius, I'm sure somebody out there could correct me. That's probably between 80 and 90 degrees, I guess. Yeah, so that's that's pretty hot. You know, that's like a that's like a July day here in Carolina, right? So this is average with good charge. Everything's working like it should. We're seeing about 225 on the high side and about 30 on the low side. So we'll call this good. Okay? And so all these other ones will be compared to that. You remember on the chart before, we had a low and a high for each side and, you know, what it, what it meant. So let's see if we can use that to diagnose this one. So this one, our high side, you see it's higher than the 30 that we had on, on what we consider the good car and the 225. So it's higher than that, and it's higher on the high side as well. So we're reading high on both sides. Uh, was anybody paying attention on the one, you know, we just talked about, about reading high on both sides? Care to take a guess? I got nowhere to be. <laughs> so we've got a reading here that's high on each side. Nobody? All right, you might have to jump in there, Zach. <laughs> All right. All right, so if we're reading high on both sides, this is some, one of those situations where we're, you know, we're dealing with an overcharge situation or a condenser airflow situation. You remember I said earlier that if it's overcharged, if somebody's just been steadily adding refrigerant to it, uh, or the condenser, you know, the fan or something is plugged up in the grill of the car and it's not allowing air to move through the condenser, you end up with a situation where it's high on both sides. Um, so that's, you know, definitely something to keep in mind. That's why you really, you really want to stay away from the DIY uh, 134 charges, but this is usually what you see when they're overcharged. 
All right, we got another one here, lower than the, what we consider the good car. So we're reading about 22 here, and we're reading way low on the high side. We're only reading about 100 psi on the high side. So what would we, you know, what would we want to think about if we see manifold gauges that are low on both sides, low on the low side and low on the high side? And since you guys don't want to answer, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> That one's system low on charge. So if it's low on both sides, that's usually an indication that refrigerant is low. And so, you know, you need to find the leak or, you know, or have refrigerant at the proper amount. And I should say that I keep talking about that. There is only one really good way to make sure that the proper amount of refrigerant is in there. I know that you can do it with manifold gauges and you can add some and read it and add some and read it. But the only correct way and the way to make sure you're not got air in the system or anything like that is to actually recover it in a recovery machine and it weighs it, and then it's recycled, and then you put the proper amount back in the car. Uh, that's really the only proper way to do it, and I know that there's probably going to be somebody that kills me on the comments, talks about the way that they do it, and that's fine, but the really only proper way to do it is actually pull it all out, put a vacuum on the car, make sure it holds a vacuum, make sure it doesn't leak, and then add the proper amount using a machine that can actually weigh the refrigerant as it goes in and comes out. So that's the only really correct way to do it. All right, last one. You guys still with me, I hope. So we got really, really high low side pressure. So we said that normal is around 30 PSI in this particular case. We're talking about a really hot day outside. Uh, and we're seeing low pressure side, you know, somewhere close to 50, 45 PSI, something like that, which wouldn't normally be, it wouldn't concern me too much if it was really hot and humid outside. But what would concern me is that we've got a pretty low high side pressure. You see right here that high side pressure is about what? over 100 psi down you know it's somewhere down in the 100 uh, 100 psi range versus the 225 so in this case we've got low high side or high low side pressure and low high side pressure so this is this is kind of a kind of a mixed up deal it's it's high on this side and it's low on this side and that's what we were talking about earlier with a weak compressor you can actually see that they're actually moving toward each other the the, the refrigerant is actually trying to uh, is actually trying to equalize because the compressor is weak. It's not sucking down as hard on the low side and it's not compressing as hard on the high side. And so you end up with a, a high here and low here situation. Uh, another thing that you can see sometime, and I didn't have, a, I didn't have a, a slide on that, is that if the needles are bouncing, if you see it bounce like that, that's usually an indication that a valve is bad in the compressor because it's actually open and close and open and close and you actually see that on the gauge set. But okay, well, hopefully you guys got something out of that. Uh, there we go. I see some answers coming through now, so good, 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 good. Maybe you guys were answering me and I just couldn't see them. So, David, I see needs a charge. Uh, hopefully you said that on this one right here because that is the one that needed the charge. Uh, not sure when that came through. But I also see blockage as well. And blockage is, is a good thought. Um, but you would typically see it really low on this side and really high on that side. So you would see it opposite of each other. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good thought too. Blockage could definitely make them make them act funny. And this, we're not going to go over this. I just thought this was something interesting to include in the handout materials because it has kind of an average uh, pressure for the ambient temperature outside. Now again, these are not exact numbers, so don't say you know, oh, I read 37, you know, or or 47, and it's out of range. You know, it's not exact because again, temperature, pressure, humidity, it all comes into play uh, when you're talking about AC systems. But I thought it was a really cool chart and somewhere really cool to uh, kind of start off with. If you got access to a set of manifold gauges or you, you know, if you're having some sort of problem, uh, you can actually hook this up and you can use this chart and kind of just see if you're in the ballpark or if it's really off one way or the other. You know, if you're seeing 20 to 30 psi differences, you know, then yeah, then I, I would say that there's a problem. But just don't take those as, to, as hard numbers because those numbers can fluctuate quite a bit. So just keep that in mind. Well, I have, that is all I've got for you guys. It looks like I've uh, run it up on 7.59, so I think we filled that hour pretty nicely. Um, getting a little better at that. Some of these go, you know, 47 minutes. Some of them go an hour and 10 minutes. So, you know, we've, we've, we're nailing that part of it down. But as I always do on all these classes, I know I talk really fast, and I know that was a lot of information thrown at you. But does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, or anything? Um, you know, while we're still up and running here, I would love to hear from you guys. You know, while we're uh, while we're here live on this, so trip over the TV stand. 
but yeah, if you guys have any questions, comments, anything like that, I would definitely love to hear them. Uh, would definitely, you know, if you have any anything I want to go, you want me to go back on and kind of clarify, or uh, or anything like that. Now, as always, if you you know you want to go back and check this out, this will be posted up on YouTube tonight. Uh, just search Billy Gerald or Fuel Billy Gerald Fuel by Faith on YouTube, and you can go back and see all of the live streams that we've done. Uh, and that brings me to my next order of business, which hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, will will work out for us. So. I've been given the opportunity to go back to doing live in-person classes and you know my regular guys the guys that have been in, uh, in, in classes before you know you know how these things work um, but you know with all of this COVID stuff going on and these regulations and things that are that are in place um, I don't know how many that I can have in class at one time I believe it to be 10 but I don't know that for sure uh, and also I don't want to lose any of the online uh, people that we've been able to pick up because honestly you know, I've, I've gone to have usually a very small class every week to having quite a few of you guys that end up seeing this either live or throughout the week or on YouTube or whatever the case is. So, what I really want to do is next week I want to go back into the classroom and actually have them in person again, but I want to keep doing the live stream. I want to, you know, actually do the live stream while we're doing the in-class uh, session. So what are your thoughts on that? You think that's cool? Would you want to keep on watching, uh, you know, if we keep doing these? As we move forward, uh, would you want to come to a live class here at Tanglewood Church, or uh, you know, do you want to just say, you know, forget it, just go back to the live class and forget the live stream altogether? Let me know. You know, like I said, it's it's definitely something I'd uh, like to hear your hear your input on. So let's see what we got here. David Clayton, wife's car blowing cold, then hit warm burst for a second. That's a good one. Uh, you know, we talked about blend door actuators just a second ago, and usually you see a door, you know, that is failing. And you know, I know, I know what she drives, and I, I know how how common that is. Uh, but yeah, if it's blowing cold and then it just goes hot, and then back to cold, or if it goes hot, you know, you don't have any control over it with the uh, with the climate control module. I would probably look toward a blend door motor or a blend door actuator first, because you know, it, those gears inside there strip. And you know it might hold it in the cold position, and then, and you know it'll spin again and bring it back up. So I would kind of be leaning toward that. Um, usually, if the compressor cuts off, or if you know you have some sort of refrigerant problem, it takes a long time for it to get warm. You know because that evaporator is cold, and you got the air moving through it. Uh, and you know if the compressor turns off, it usually doesn't get warm immediately. Although, you know it could happen in a few seconds. Uh, but if you get, you know, like a blast of hot air and then back to cold, I would probably lean toward, uh, you know, some sort of blend door actuation or, or some sort of door actuation. Again, that would be a really good one to uh, to use as an example. So hopefully I'll get that car and, uh, and maybe use that in one of our classes as a diagnosis. Um, all right, we got another comment that says live is better. So that's cool. I'm glad that somebody uh, <laughs> would definitely rather see it live. Uh, I'm looking forward to having having people in front of me again. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy bouncing off of people and having conversations. But I do know that we've been getting quite a few views on this on the live stream, and I want to keep that up, and I want to keep you guys engaged. And hopefully, you guys will come out and see, you know, have a live class with us on on a Sunday night. So that would be really cool. Um, well, cool. Well, until then, you know, you guys know where to reach me. Reach me at Fuel by Faith on Facebook, Billy Gerald. Uh, search YouTube for Billy Gerald and Tanglewood Church, of course. Uh, you know, if you guys want to sign up for classes there, uh, let us know. You know, like I said, sign up online at tanglewoodchurch.com. And if we get, you know, eight to ten people or whatever the case is, then we'll make that happen. So, you know, if you want to do that, cool. As always, if you have any prayer requests or needs, you know, you can hit me up. You can private message if you don't want to make it public. Or you can go to tanglewoodchurch.com and they have a prayer group there, prayer uh, warriors that are on it 24-7. Post it up there to be private, discreet, and there'll be a lot of people willing to pray for you. Uh, with that being said, let's close in prayer and uh, and finish this one out. <clears throat> let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time that we get to, to, to spend together, even though we're not here in person, Father. I hope that somebody out there is watching this and somebody will gain something from it. Father, I just hope that you have been glorified through this, and I hope that uh, you would keep each and every one of us safe as we, uh, as we move through this week until we can meet again. And Father, we do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Well, I appreciate you, and, uh, and hopefully, hopefully I will see you guys very, very soon in person. 
Uh, or if you continue to watch online, I hope you continue to tune in uh, because I think we're going to continue to stream this as we move forward. Um, good deal, good deal. I see uh, Ronnie Waters says, I like the online. It will help with exposure. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, good deal, guys. Well, until next time, we will see you soon. All right, y'all be safe.